Hi, everybody. Yes, we are still here. And welcome to Pro Arms Podcast number 65. Mass, let's get started, I guess, with just so a little bit of background, and then we'll talk about John's interview specifically. Basically, what we had here is something that I called back in the 80s the OK Corral shooting of the 20th century. And others have called it that. And the reason is it was probably the most studied gunfight of its century. There were many lessons that it taught. It was very complicated to reconstruct and will remain forever uncertain in some small elements of the reconstruction. It lasted for minutes, not seconds. Ten men were involved. Four died at the scene. Three sustained permanent injuries from their bullet wounds. And everybody has always had a different piece of the elephant. Mm -hmm. uh, each of the men who survived it spoke of the, the tunnel vision that they experienced. And no one of them was, you know, on a 50-foot crane where he could <coughs> look down and see where everybody was at any given second. It was a very complicated crime scene that covered a fairly large area. There were reports that some of the civilian witnesses uh, were seen picking up spent casings as souvenirs, which is one reason we'll never even know exactly how many shots were fired at that scene. Basically, what we had was a two-man crime wave that had been going on for some time. The two perpetrators who were not identified until this shooting were two men in their early 30s who had met in the United States Army, Michael Platt and William Maddox. Their crime wave had basically gone in three directions. There were what was later called the Rock Pit Murders. Uh, these guys would steal their cars and some of their guns by going to remote areas on the Tam Miami Trail out in the Everglades where people would go to informally shoot and plink. They would attack those people, murder them, steal their cars, steal their guns. And in a moment we'll see how that actually led to the, the shootout in question. The second prong was their particularly violent armed robberies of armored trucks. And their third was their violent armed robberies of banks in the area, all in the South Miami area. The pattern was escalating. It fell into the lap of, among others, the C-1 squad of FBI at their Miami office, which at that time was you know, almost 300 agents. Uh, the C-1 squad was the reactive unit, and they handled things like kidnappings, bank robberies that came under federal jurisdiction, etc. The leader of the squad, Supervisory Special Agent Gordon McNeil, had decided it would be worth their time to do a rolling stakeout. They had determined that the majority of the bank hits had been on Friday mornings. So of the roughly 18 people in the unit, he was able to assemble more than a dozen who were on a rolling stakeout in radio contact with one another, covering a huge area, which was, of course, the huge area the Predators had been hitting. So they were very thinly spread. Uh, he had more than a dozen agents out. By the time this shooting was over, only eight had been able to respond. Four to one odds, two perpetrators, eight agents, would sound pretty good if you were you know, on, on the streets of Tombstone in 1881 and it was the O.K. Corral shooting. What you had here were highly mobile guys with pretty heavy firepower. Of the eight agents who responded, they had between them two shotguns, only one of which was able to be deployed the way the shooting went down. Among some of the other agents who could not get there in time, there was at least one M16, one HK MP5 submachine gun. Primarily, these guys were armed with their handguns. Uh, three members of the C-1 squad who engaged in the fight were also members of the local office SWAT team, 
And their issue weapon at the time was the 14, 15 shot magazine, Smith & Wesson model 459. And I say 14, 15 uh, because at that time both capacity magazines uh, were in production. The perpetrators, Platt and Maddox, were each carrying a six inch barrel, 357 Magnum and a shoulder holster. Michael Platt was armed with a Mini-14 semi-automatic rifle, uh, not the selective fire machine gun portrayed in the TV movie. And Platt was armed with a Smith & Wesson Model 3000 pistol grip shotgun, uh, basically Smith & Wesson's analog to the Remington 870. The Mini-14 in particular turned out to be a devastating force multiplier. Yeah. On that particular morning, the vehicle they were looking for in particular was a black Chevrolet Monte Carlo. It had been stolen from the one survivor of the rock pit murders, a gentleman named Collazzo. He had been shot and left for dead by Platt and Maddox. He had managed, severely wounded, to stagger out of the Everglades and give a description of the two men who had shot him, who had taken his vehicle, taken his guns. And with little else to go on, attempting to be, the, you know, they were called the reactive squad. They were doing their damnedest to be proactive. And I guess McNeil figured the best shot they had was the rolling stakeout. So basically, the, the men who were on scene that day were Agent Richard Manazzi, uh, alone in his, what they call a G car, the government issue plainclothes vehicle, unmarked vehicle. Uh, Supervisory Special Agent Gordon McNeil himself, who had a shotgun that he was not able to deploy during the circumstances. Ben Grogan and Jerry Dove, both members of the SWAT team. Uh, Grogan driving in Grogan's vehicle with Dove in the shotgun seat, uh, each armed with their 9mm pistols and a spare magazine apiece. The man who was gracious enough to give us this interview, John Hanlon, was armed with his service revolver and a backup handgun. Uh, and he was driving his vehicle with Edmundo Morellis at his side. Morellis was carrying his privately owned 4-inch 357. Both men's guns were loaded with 38 plus P. And Morellis had brought his department uh, issue or agency issue 870, uh, loaded with five rounds of double lot buck. Those are the men who made the initial contact Midway into the firefight, two more agents were able to get there from across this broad distance. Uh, Gilbert Arancia driving his vehicle with SWAT officer Ron Reisner uh, riding shotgun. So basically it was eight against two. The two, however, got to act first. And it's, the history of it is that action beats reaction. In the course of the gunfight, Grogan and Dove were both shot and killed. Hanlon and Morellis, both seriously wounded. McNeil, gravely wounded. Arantia and Manazzi, slightly wounded. Uh, it helps to know the names of the players as, as we hear John Hanlon explain who was doing what uh, from his perspective in the course of the gunfight. Uh, two of the agents lost their primary handguns in the, the crash, the felony stop, the ramming of the fugitive vehicle off the road that began the, the shootout. Uh, Manazzi had put his gun in his lap. Hanlon had put his either in his lap or by his side. John Hanlon is not a gun guy, but he is clearly a survival guy. Mm -hmm. One of the things that comes out of this is here you had a brilliant man who was, you know, had his law degree before he joined the Bureau and got it to join the Bureau. He wasn't that much into guns, but he was in a survival. And he alone, uh, well not alone, uh, uh, Reisner also was carrying a second weapon and deployed it at one point. But he made a point of always carrying the backup gun from his days to you know, working in Miami during the Mariel boat lift. And this is a guy who literally had given up a supervisory position to go back to the street because he simply loved the street work. He loved the, the satisfaction of being able to recover the kidnapped child. To him, it was what it was all about. And one of the things that you see in this, it ain't about eight gunfighters going against two bad guys. 
It's about eight incredibly dedicated law enforcement officers who understood that their job was people. And one of the things that absolutely shines through Hanlon's discussion is when he talks about the character that, that men like this need to have, that the men who were there and fought for all of us that day did have. Uh, his, uh, he doesn't recall the model number of his gun. Uh, the FBI records show that he had been issued actually what's today a collector's item, uh, one of the two and a half inch barrel, heavy barrel Model 10s that had been special ordered from Smith & Wesson for the Bureau. And you'll hear Hanlon discuss that as one of the learning points along with, with other learning points. But basically what we're looking at here is a little bit the history of the kind of man who protects us on the street. His recollection of that that hideous moment, those those hideous minutes, and the lessons that can be learned from it, what it's like to go through it, and how to come back from it and continue as he did for many, many years to become a productive member of not only society but the criminal justice system. Well, I think that's, in listening to the recording for show prep here, uh, if anybody's expecting to hear a blow-by-blow -blow reconstruction of the gun battle, uh, that really isn't going to happen. What I see about this that it absolutely entranced me as I was listening to it was the fact that, first of all, we're going to start out with some of uh, John Hanlon's background, how he got into the Bureau, what he'd done in the Bureau. His, you know, it's very revealing about his personality and his motivation and how he got from a, you know, brand new agent to one of the people, as you say, participated in the, probably the gunfight of the century, uh, how his path took him to uh, that fateful location uh, and then it's more about his impressions I think of what happened around him what was going on around him and what he was reacting to than it is some sort of a forensic analysis of, of what happened and then his comments uh, uh, particularly toward the end and this is a long interview we got to warn you about that I guess up front but particularly toward the end, his comments is about his philosophy of surviving and uh, what he's tried to pass on to others that he's spoken to over the years. Uh, I found that to be particularly uh, interesting. So uh, again, this isn't going to be a reconstruction of the gunfight. This is oral history from a guy who was there and is still around, thank heaven, uh, to be able to talk with us about it. For, for those who have studied this gunfight, there's also some new information. I had not heard until I spoke with John Hanlon about the courageous deputy from Metro Dade who had run across the street while the shots were still being fired to come to Hanlon's assistance. People look at Manazi, the first to come under fire from the perpetrators, uh, who was wounded in the fight, and who, because he'd lost the only gun he had in the vehicle, was unable to return fire, as if he was sort of the orphan of the incident. Hanlon brings out a telling point about this courageous man. Uh, he, re he makes the point that Michael Platt, feet away, not yards away, feet away from him and Eddie Morales, as he raised the semi-automatic rifle to open fire, at that moment, it was Manazi who rammed the fugitive Monte Carlo from behind, spun that vehicle out in front of Hanlon's vehicle and Morellis's, and literally saved the lives of John Hanlon and Eddie Morellis. Right. And yeah. that, that has gone unnoticed for a quarter century, and I thank John Hanlon for bringing that up. So, folks, sit back, enjoy a interesting, and again, lengthy, but interesting to all of us who study these kinds of things, uh, interview with a guy who is giving us his recollections and his impressions and his feelings like you will not get anywhere else. And so here is Mass's interview with 
then Special Agent John Hanlon from the Miami FBI. Well, thanks so much for taking the time with us. Uh, could we start by giving us a little bit of uh, your history? Were you an attorney prior to joining the FBI? Yes, I was. Uh, and it's December 13 of 2010, about 30 points. Yeah, um, I don't know how far you want to go back. Um, I was born in November 1937 in uh, Delaware County in Darby, which is just west of Philadelphia. We moved up to East Orange, New Jersey when I was two. Uh, that's suburban Newark. My dad was an electrical engineer. Uh, working with Westinghouse Electric Corporation. Uh, we moved in 1946 uh, to uh, Arlington, Virginia, suburban Washington. I'm a product of the Catholic school system, Jesuits at Gonzaga High School, got out in Washington, D.C., got out of there in uh, 1956. I went to Mount St. Mary's College in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and took uh, business major in accounting and then uh, didn't like accounting so I had an opportunity to go to law school. I graduated from Georgetown Law School in Washington, D.C. in 1963. And I joined the FBI in August of 1963, which was sort of my uh, lifelong ambition. The reason I took accounting and went to, went to law school. Uh, where were you first assigned with the Bureau? Well, I was transferred in uh, late November 1963 to Tampa. Did uh, general criminal stuff. And in those days, you'd never stayed in your first office long. And I was transferred in February 1965 to Dallas. And then in January of 66, uh, the White Knights of the KKK, the same group that put the three under the dam in summer of 64, killed Vernon Boehmer. And 20 of us were sent to Mississippi in January of 64 to work that case. And I was there until May of uh, 66. Uh, we arrested everybody. And I came back to, to Dallas. I was on the bank robbery squad there before I left and came back to the bank robbery squad. And then there was a killing in Louisiana. They were going to send the same bunch. And at that point, I thought it might be fine to go out to California and out to Monterey, California in June of 66 to the Army Language School, took Spanish, and was then transferred to uh, Miami in December of 66 and was on the major criminal squad there. Uh, that was at the height of the airplane hijacking and uh, then the planes, of course, came back into Miami, so they started this nice supervisory thing. And I took over the floor to 12 and 68 and then I got transferred to the headquarters uh, in Washington in uh, March of 69. And I was in the criminal division, and then you, at that point, the uh, promotion progression was you went to the training division, which I did, and counseled a new agents class in 71, then went on the inspection staff, and then came back and was in uh, Hoover. It died, and we went through, and Kelly formed this planning and evaluation division, and I was in there until... Uh, August of 74, and I was transferred down to Puerto Rico as the assistant special agent in charge. And I was there a year. I didn't get along with the management people, and I uh, was talking when I should have been listening, that I wanted to go back on the bricks uh, to Miami. And they were mad at me. And I learned you never ask them for stuff when they're mad at you. And I, so I went to, uh, instead of going to the bricks in Miami, uh, I went to New Orleans and was on the waterfront and then on the bank robbery kidnapping squad. And then uh, they needed a corruption. They wanted to find us back in the, in the days of when corruption became a big thing. And so they formed a squad and they asked me if I'd take over the squad as a supervisor, which I did. And if you can't assign corruption in New Orleans, you're hurting and uh, they went real well, and I got transferred up to the New York 
to the Criminal Organized Crime Division uh, in Manhattan. And uh, about that point, I was up there. I got, went up there. Let's see, I got to New Orleans in 75. I went to New York in 78. And then 80, I finally woke up to the fact that uh, uh, the reason I came into the Bureau is not to... Uh, uh, have to be nice to anybody I didn't want to be nice to and not have a predictable day. So uh, I said, I'm done. I want to go back on the street to Miami. And they weren't particularly mad at me at that point, so I came down. And the other problem was, as you move through the management system in those days, as your kids graduated from high school, you might be in Arkansas, so you'd leave your kid in Arkansas and go to get your next transfer to Chicago, and you stop start dropping kids around, and I didn't want to do that. And uh, I wanted them exposed to uh, my parents who were in South Florida. So in May of 1980, I stepped down and came down and was assigned to Fort Lauderdale Resident Agency, and I did a lot of undercover stuff. Uh, I was hired to hold up museums and launder money and dispose of stolen cars. And we had a pretty successful run there. And then uh, I didn't particularly get along with the supervisor. And then in, let's see, I got here in May of 80. And then in early 84, Christopher Wilder went on his cross-country killing spree and I got transferred down to Miami to take over that case. He had killed a couple of girls in Miami and then he killed about eight or nine women in his cross country tour. So I had that case, took over that case and then uh, they made a TV show out of that. He made the top ten, eventually got killed up in April of 84 up in uh, uh, Colebrook, New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah, that was my case. And then that's, and then in uh, August, there was the Portella kidnap murder case. And uh, I was able to find the rental car that they used to kidnap the kid, and we found his keys in it. And found, uh, got the rental contract with the fingerprints off of that, and ended up, we ended up catching everybody. Uh, they made a TV show out of that when that was kind of strange when they called me about it, you know, they eventually had wrapped 90 feet of duct tape around the kid's head. And I thought it was a little strange that they would pick a case where we didn't get him back alive, but it was a highly emotional case as was the, the wilder thing. Cause you knew, uh, the longer the thing went, you know, he was killing people under pretty horrible conditions. Mm -hmm. So anyway, then when that was the Portella in 84, and then we had the Albana, I had the Albana kidnapping case over Christmas of 85. And uh, I was on McNeil's squad, of course, when we came down, when I came down from Fort Lauderdale. And Ben Grogan, I'd known when he was an agent in Miami when I came in 66, so I knew him forever. Uh, and so we were wrapping up the Albana case and Grogan, you know, that was around that time, a series of uh, armored cars and stick-ups. And I ended up, I don't remember, I either had the robberies and he had the you know, the armored cars or I had the armored cars and he, you know, I don't remember. But I've had a multiple bank robbery case uh Roy Curtis Barry getting ready for trial and as as well as the Albana, we got him back alive and arrested everybody. I was getting them ready for trial. And that's when Rogan and uh, McNeil decided that we, you know, they were pulling these stick ups on Fridays down in South Miami. That fella had walked out of, Cagliasso had walked out of uh, the yeah, Everglades. Nice survive and uh, that thing we uh, at, at that point we actually thought they might be policemen because uh, he had they had asked him if he was a policeman before they shot him so I remember we didn't know whether they were black white or red we knew who shot him Coyasso, but we didn't know who the stick up guys were and that was Coyasso. a week 
What was it, Toyatso's Monte Carlo that uh, they were driving? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, at that point, but up until that point, we didn't know whether they were black, white, or red. A week before the shooting, an agent named Fulton and I went down around in the area where the Wind dixie shooting was, and we were all riding around down here looking for the white Bronco. And we pulled into a, a condo parking lot. And, you know, when you're looking for a particular car, that's all you see. And there was sitting a Bronco. We got out and Fulton took the name, took the license number down, sent it off, and it came back uh, after the shooting, uh, registered to either manage or plant. And Oddly enough, there was a, one of the license plates that showed up in one of the stick-ups or shootings. Uh, it was registered to a woman who had gone to a living well lady, and nobody ever saw her again after that. That Her car was found in that same parking lot. But anyway, the night before, as I indicated yesterday, I remember right before going out a couple of days before, and uh, I sat back in a corner and... Uh, Face and Grogan, and we were talking about it. Nelson was there, and a few of the other guys, probably Dove. And uh, Grogan commented that, well, we caught these guys, found these guys, uh, and there wouldn't be any trial. And he used to go out, he was kind of an outdoorsy kind of guy, and he used to go out with a couple of the boys out into the Everglades, you know, down near the rock pits and uh, whatever. And then I don't know, remember at what point Brielle's body was found. I don't know whether Brielle's was found before the shooting or after. I think it was after. But anyway, as a result of, of the uh, that type of thing, uh, you know, Grogan would go out and see who he might stumble on out there. But anyway, uh, the decision was made. So that it was, a, you know, let's uh, let's spread out the boys along Route One down there, and who knows. Uh, we were working real closely with Metro Dade. Of course, since there was no concrete information that anything was going to transpire, they, you know, they deferred. And uh, I, like I say, I wasn't even going to go. I came in the next day using it as an opportunity not to wear a coat and tie. And Dove asked, you know, said, "Hey, I were riding down there." I kind of blew him off, and then Eddie asked me. He said, "That was that's okay, you know, no." I did not. I mean, if it, it, it answers your question the other day, did I think they were going to show up? No, because usually these things, even when you don't, even when you do have information, it, it usually never works out. But anyway, Eddie asked me, hey, uh, what's going on down there? I think fine. So, yep, I bet. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Would, would it be safe to say that that was the generally prevalent feeling of the squad, that it was a long shot, whether you'd actually find them that Oh, well, I mean, I never I never discussed it with them, but, I mean, we were all pretty very experienced. Most of us, of course, the very experienced guys. I can't speak for the others, but I could presume that that was the feeling. I certainly had that feeling, that it, and, and it was a long shot. I mean, it was... Uh, and I've been on these things before, and uh, like I say, I've been on. I mean, I've been out all night on informant information. They're going to burgle some bank, and uh, I've been out on these things where you know I've been in the bank or outside the bank when these people are supposed to be coming. And of course, never. I don't can't think in my experience, and I had a lot of it uh, that it ever. In any event, uh, so I jumped in. Uh, my four-wheeled, uh, my black wall tired uh, Fleet Pursuit Plymouth, I think, or Dodge, I forget what it was. And uh, we went on down there and met at the Home Depot. I don't know whether you've been down there. There's a Home Depot there. We met in the parking lot. Uh, there had been a, a Coyasso had provided, a, a, you know, his thoughts in the form of a picture of what they these guys look like, which they always aren't, they're useless usually, they always usually look the same. Uh, then we had a conference, met some guys from Homestead, I forget the name of the bank I had, I was supposed to set up on, but we were spread out over a long time, Terry Nelson was there, drove in a chorus of when I was eating the rest of the gang, so we had our conference and we broke up, and uh we rode around, Eddie and I decided where we were going to park. I forget the name of the bank we had. And then uh, Olid, who was such, just a tremendous guy, who we had a 
fire him up with a couple of biscuits. I told uh, Eddie, or I told McNeil that we, you know, we, uh, I got to get Eddie set up to eat, and uh, so I did. And uh, I forget. Um, at some point, McNeil asked us to go back into the to, to go. I don't think we had gone into the bank yet, but to go into the bank and just tell them that we were in the area. And I, had, I told him, I came over there, I had to eat. And that's when uh, the guy who later became the bank robbery coordinator, instead of us going in the bank, he did. And then we circled around, and that's when we came up onto uh, that traffic light, and it was by a bank that Platinum Maddox had previously, I forget what street it was, that Platinum Maddox had robbed before, and there was a Metro Day cop car sitting in front of it. When we pulled up to the lake, in fact, he was the son of the head of the homicide squad, a good guy by the name of McCarthy. And I'd become real close with those guys from working on those kidnapping cases and the Wilder case with them. Great bunch of guys. But any of that, uh, we were there at the light, and the light, I had Grogan and Dove were ahead of us. Eddie, was, I was driving. And uh, the light turned, and... Uh, we turned right and Grogan and Grogan was ahead of us and we went down. I pulled into the parking lot where we were gonna set up and that's when Grogan came on the air saying we're behind the the black Monte Carlo and we threw our coffee out the window and Eddie had uh, got it the shotgun and we pulled north on Federal Highway and um, I told Eddie to ask him to call the cross streets so we'd know where we were in relation to them. And it got pretty tense at that point, I can tell you. And uh, just about that time, Grogan or Dove started calling the cross streets, and we were hitting them pretty well right on the money, so we were right behind them. I didn't see them. And then they went on down by, uh, I forget what street it was, turned right past the post office, and then took another right back through that residential area. And as I came back up through... Uh, we're going north, or I'm sorry, going south through that residential section, and I there was I could see Grogan's car and Dove, and I could see through them uh, their car and uh, the bad guys, and you could see I came on here, or Eddie came on here, they were loading up, and I told Eddie to tell him that uh, we're coming up on them, but we're going to get made in the parlance, you know, because of the your knock around basic. You know, black wall tarred car. I said, tell them we're coming up on them, but they're going to know we're law enforcement. And I think they probably knew already because of Grogan and Dove, right? I forget they were in some white. I forget what they were driving. Olds, I think. I don't know. I don't remember. Anyway, I said, tell them we're coming, but uh, we're going to get, they're going to spot us as, as uh, law enforcement. Then they took a little bit, a little right jog to the right and then the left down 82nd and and I think that's when and I didn't see him but that's I think McNeil was coming the other way and that's when he said they're loading up a long barrel weapon and then we kind of were in parade there when we took the left on 82nd Avenue and I was getting antsy because we didn't want to didn't want him to get back on uh, Federal Highway and uh, tail end of the rush hour and there's always a lot of traffic on that thing and that's when uh, Grogan called for a felony car stop, and there was a kind of little hesitation, and I went around them and slammed into them. And I was pushing against them, and they were pushing against me. And I looked across Eddie. I'll never forget I looked over at Maddox, who was driving, and, uh, and I said at the time, and I, I could identify him to this day, I think. He looked very determined to have the handlebar mustache, and he wasn't particularly afraid of us, is my impression. And then all of a sudden, like, the car died. I thought the thing, because uh, and we were, the gravel was flying. I was trying to push him across this swale so that we'd be shooting at, at the back of this strip shopping mall. And of course, to the left, there were duplexes, and and all of a sudden, the car died. I didn't realize it, but uh, I guess it was Platt was coming over the driver to shoot us, and I didn't know where the Benazzi was behind us. The Benazzi, in order to distract them, which probably was a good idea at the time, slammed them. 
And that's when I thought my car died, but it catapulted them in front of me. And of course, they had nothing to nothing to push or to hold them from going right. So they must have swerved right. And of course, I swerved. No, they swerved left, and I swerved right and sheared off. Uh, they had uh, that death P&L substation that had these logs that kind of embedded in the ground, sawed off, that kind of defined the driveway, and I sheared off one of them, and then I hit a tree, and I collapsed on the car, and then T-boned into the back of the uh, wall there, and there was a uh, uh, edge, which I think cushioned the blow, but the car kind of collapsed. I got out. I felt Eddie get out. You know, the car tipped. He's a pretty heavy boy. And I'm looking south. I'm, I hear, I'm looking south, figuring they're still going, and I heard the banging. And I swiveled around to my left, and that's when I saw Grogan stand. They were in, still in the boys. Uh, my and Clap were still in their car under the trees of bottle brush and uh, across the street. And Grogan was, or, I'm sorry, yeah, Grogan was out of the car shooting at him. And that's all I saw. I, I guess I got tunnel vision, so I swung around. I had lost my uh, revolver. I had uh, lost the, the two-inch, two-and-a-half-inch barrel magnum frame. I don't know what it's Smith and Wesson. I don't know what make it or model it was. I don't remember. I might have known. No, you, you, had take, you had taken the gun out prior to the crash? Yeah, right, right. Uh, was it? Which was probably not a good idea. No, was it, was the gun like under your thigh or in your lap? It was right there, yeah, yeah handy. And I probably shouldn't have done that, but in any event, I remember a movie I had watched when I was a youngster during World War II called OSS, and it was Alan Ladd. And he was dropped behind enemy lines. It scared the hell out of me. And, but I always thought I could do anything or be all right as long as somebody was with me. And I saw Grogan, and I didn't want him. And I, I didn't. And it was exactly my thought was I didn't want him to be by himself. And I was never a big pistolero, but I knew from the angle that I was at, and having shot that little piece of garbage, five-inch shot Smith before, that I. You can't do much with it, and I was too far away, and on the angle, I was afraid I might shoot Grogan. The five shot was the backup gun in your ankle holster? Yeah, it was on my ankle, on my left ankle. So yeah, I grabbed that. Did, did you always carry a backup gun, John, or was that just for that? Uh, most of it, yeah. I, once I went down, uh, after I left Fort Lauderdale, and, of course, we were pretty damn busy. That was the height of a lot of the Mario stuff so after when I went down to Miami and started working the kidnappings and they, we had on that squad we had the unlawful flight guys and the kidnappers and the bank robbers and Miami was pretty wild in those days and so that's I always felt a little better with it and uh, sorry to interrupt we were out but no, that's not a problem. We were out every night. I mean, it was like most squads. You know, you get 18 guys. You have like four. I mean, we had some really, we had a number of real self-starters, of which I would include myself, but Bob Ross and Reisner, just a go-getter, Grogan. We, you know, they were, I might have left a few people out, but then I, Dove would come along and, you know, and then you had about four or five guys that would follow, and then you had about, five or six that just as soon stayed home, you know. When we were out working, it was great. I never had so much fun in my life in, uh, in my time. Uh, we were really active in uh, any event. Uh, so I hunched down, uh, and I felt fine. The yelling and screaming, and there was a lot of smoke down underneath uh, because we were down under those trees. So I wanted to get across the street, so I ran across that swale and across the street to the back of uh, Rogan's car. And by the time I got over there, the passenger was gone. And I got behind the left, uh, I'm sorry, the right side of Grogan's trunk there, and I let a couple go. I went down, I popped up and let the rest of them, and I'm thinking, and then I dropped down on my knees, and it was kind of funny because uh, 
uh, you know, I'm thinking, how long is this going to last? And also I'm thinking, geez, I'm not a bad guy, and they're trying to kill me. Of course, I was trying to, to kill them. No, you were firing at Platt, correct? Uh, well, I forget. Was not, was Maddox, I think, was the driver. Yeah. I don't no. remember. Was Maddox the driver? Uh, Maddox was driving, and Platt had been on yeah, the passenger. Yeah, yeah. I was shooting at Maddox, or at Maddox, because by the time I got across the street, the passenger Platt was gone. So I was shooting, and I wasn't that far from him. Uh, but again, that you know, there was. Yeah. How, how far do you figure you were, John? Oh Lord, I don't know. I it, you can if you have the crime scene photos, you can figure it out. I figured I don't know. We were the length of of uh, Grogan's car, and then there was I was I think it was like two the length of his car and, and a little bit of theirs. I mean, I, yeah. we were, I was pretty damn close. But of course, those freaking guns are so, you know they're they're inaccurate as hell. I had used it in Deck, Texas, when I was on the bank robbery squad, and we had to chase some guy and I. And I just had that one, and after that, I retired it, you know, because I thought, oh, my God, you know, because the thing fits in the palm of your hand. So uh, I'm thinking, uh, you know, uh, they're trying to kill me, and I'm not a bad guy, but, of course, I was doing everything I could to kill them. And it's as interesting because you'll watch. It's one of the impressions that I was left with, which is kind of funny when you watch the movies, you know, I guess all's quiet on the Western Front or something, and the the guy is going through all the throws as the enemy advances as to whether he can pull the trigger. I can tell you, it never crossed my mind. Uh, if I hadn't run out of ammunition, I'd have still been shooting. I never bothered me when I was trying to kill him. And, uh, was this your first shooting, John? Yeah, it was the first shooting, right. I'd had my gun out before. I'd, you know, I'd walked up on escapees by myself and I'd had my gun out before but it was the first shooting and it didn't bother me at all I, you know, I yeah, if I could have killed them and killed them quicker it would have made my day but not pulling the trigger I under, and I understand maybe you know better but I think uh, I read or found you know you're being a trainer I think there's instances where guys won't and I find that I don't know whether that's true or not, but if it is, I find that pretty unusual. But in any event, I went down on my hands and knees behind Grogan's car. I was kind of to the right side of the trunk there, and uh, I was doing great up to that point. I wasn't afraid. I, I don't know when I got hit in the head. I don't know whether that was when I came across the street or when later on I found a notch out of my head. I don't know when that happened, but... Um, I went down and then I never got so scared in my life because uh, there's all this yelling and screaming and banging and I got to reload this silly gun and uh, you can't look, you know, to look going on. And then I remember I got a couple of them in and the guy, he missed me. I felt the concussion go along the uh, length of my right arm and then he must have got the range. And that's when uh, I took the one through the index finger and out and then through my thumb on my right hand and uh, the back of my arm and then a bunch of shrapnel into my uh, groin and thigh and the one that went in, I don't know whether it was shrapnel or what it was, that went into the back of my arm geyser. The blood, it was like it reminded me of the Wiley Coyote when the oil well comes in and uh, they shot to the arm and the fingers which so like being hit with a sledgehammer and I flopped over on my back and the gun went flying and I threw my left hand over my wrist to stop this geyser of blood and uh, I said to Ben I've been hit and I never saw Ben until he fell down and died. But I said, Ben, I've been hit. And Ben says, where is everybody? Which was kind of a disheartening. And when I flipped on my back, I looked in the direction my head was now to the left side of the car, 
laying out south. And I looked to my left, and that's when I saw Platt's feet. He had come up, and if you look at the crime scene photos, you can see where he leaned against the... He was between the... He was uh, to the uh, side of the trunk there. You can see a big splotch of blood there back of the tire, and he leaned up against the car there. I saw his feet, so I pushed myself over to the... uh, left side of the car to put the car between me and him and then he came around and I looked up and he was standing between my legs and I tried to kick him and he shot and pushed back and he shot me in the groin and I said the son of a bitch shot me in the balls and I rolled over and a guy the blood geysered from my groin down to my knee I mean it was like hitting a balloon and uh, the uh, I learned you can only hurt one place at a time. I was still trying to stop the blood out of the back of my arm, and I went over in the fetal position over on the, my right side, and that's when Gov fell down, and he brushed against me, and I was looking right in his ear. He tried to raise He raised his head. I heard pow, pow. His head dropped down on the right side and I saw the hole in the back of the head. The guy had shot him in the back of the head. And I was shaking real bad. I really was hurting. And uh, that's when I figured it was all over. I knew that he had shot a, one of them had shot a guard while he was on the ground, shot him in the buttocks. Uh, so I figured he was going to finish me off. He was shooting, I guess, at Arantia and Reisner, who had come up I never saw him and uh, the grass was falling on my head and my chest and tinkling in the street and so I thought he was going to finish me off and I remember uh, thinking uh, as I said yesterday that as long as he doesn't put it against me I should be all right because all I'll hear is a bang and uh, but if he puts it against me I'm really going to go to pieces like I say, the brass was falling on me. He shot Dove in the back of the head, and the only thing separating my head from his was the width of his right shoulder. And uh, so I figured it was all. I got kind of depressed, as I remember, because I figured I didn't want to die, you know, and I thought I was gonna, and I couldn't get up. So I thought I got to stop shaking and calm myself down, which I did. And I flopped over on my bow and I heard, I, along the way, I heard uh, heard Grogan go, oh, my God. And then I heard, uh, you know, his death rattle. I heard, oh, <laughs> and he had fallen down at my feet. Oh, he had been uh, shot in the chest? Yeah, he, he, I guess he blew out his lungs and his heart and <laughs> down he went. Uh so I calmed myself down, tried to stop shaking, and then I flopped over on my back, and that's when I looked across Grogan, who had his eye jacked up. He was laying on his back. It looked like he'd been laid out. I mean, his eyes were closed. Uh, he had turned a little off color. I remember gray, kind of grayish. And that's when I saw uh, this uh, Metro Dade police officer. Uh, he turned us Rick Fry coming across the street and uh, he came up to me I heard the pow 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 which apparently was Eddie who had gotten up off the ground and walked up and finished him off but I can tell it was a different sound than all the other banging and uh, so then when I flopped over that's when I saw Fry coming across the street and uh so, but by that point, Platt and Maddox were dead. Yeah, I didn't know it. Uh, I didn't. I don't know whether I remember. I don't. I might have seen. I don't. I might have seen somebody laying in the middle of the street, which might have been McNeil. I don't know. And I flipped over on my back. But then Fry, with the shotgun, came up and put his shirt behind my head. I, I went to a presentation of this thing by uh, Rivers, Dave Rivers, while I was still out, and uh, it was pretty emotional. I don't 
didn't speak at that thing, but it was pretty emotional. It was the first time I'd heard the uh, the uh, transmissions, the radio transmissions, and uh, pretty emotional thing. Anyway, uh, and then everybody came in, and I'm thinking, my God, I had survived this thing, and I had been doing a lot of stuff with Metro Homicide, and I knew I was going to be out for a while. So I remember a guy uh, who was Singleton came up and I told him about some fingerprints I was getting for him from the military and some other stuff. And I remember asking somebody to check and see if he'd shot my testicles off. I was laying in a lot of blood. So then they wheeled me over and put me on a gurney, and I, somebody, I guess the media or something, was close and took a picture of me on the gurney, which appeared in the paper. I looked like I was in pretty uh, a lot of pain, which I was. And I didn't want to pass out because I was afraid I was dying. Yeah. I uh, you, you never lost consciousness at any point? No. The only time I got really scared was uh, when they brought me under the rooter, the... Uh, of the helicopter, and my eyes began, I guess I got a chill or something, and my eyes began to kaleidoscope, and that scared me. But once they got me on the helicopter, I I was okay again. Uh, McNeil was on the same helicopter. His eyes were closed, and he was gray. I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. And they uh, helicoptered us over to Baptist, and I was... Uh, very alert. I was in a lot of pain. I remember one of the surgeons was wearing a nice blue polo Oxford shirt and I was covered with blood and I asked him if he was going to mess with me wearing that nice shirt, you know, because I was a mess. And then uh, my wife and my kids showed up and I was alert. And uh, I remember they took me down and they put me on a board deck uh, to x-ray me and we were all in excellent physical condition. They were talking about the buildup of arteries. I was a runner, distance runner, and they were commenting on the good condition we were in. I there was a nurse was holding my head and I kept saying, I'll never complain again. I'll never complain again. And they were rolling me around and discussing whether to give me a colostomy because I had a big hunk of shrapnel in my I, of course, I had the bullet in my hip, but I had a big hunk of, of uh, shrapnel in my groin. And I was thinking, geez, I hope I, they don't do that because I'd have to wear the colostomy bag for a while. Yeah. And uh, which, uh, oddly enough, about three years ago, I was sick as a I'd never been sick a day in my life. And I was sick as a dog. And. I couldn't hold anything down. They took me, I went to the hospital and they asked if I had cancer. And then the guy asked if I'd ever had any abdominal operation. I said, no, I've been shot. And they, in the course of x-rayed me and you could see the metal. I got a lot of metal in my groin and my thigh and my arm. The only piece that ever came out, I pulled out myself. But it, apparently the scar tissue had caused uh twist in my intestine. They had to blow air down there and straighten it out, but it kind of burned me up because here I was 21 years later dealing with it, you know. But anyway, uh, they didn't do that. They just shot us full of uh, antibiotics because they don't like to cut on you because we were pretty well cut up anyway, and they figure the more cutting they do, the more chance of infection. So I was up in intensive care for three days, and then I they moved the two of us into uh, separate suites. They couldn't have been better. God, we were eating steak one day and lobster the next. I mean, it was, they were fabulous. We did get some threatening. Some people threatened. Uh, you know, we had round-the-clock guards, but, you know, the people were fabulous. And I was down there for 11 days. I remember going outside one day and feeling the sun. And I'll tell you, I only had one real bad moment. Uh, in the hospital, uh, the uh, Terry Nelson came up to see me about, you know, I was freshly out of intensive care, and uh, he was all, she came up to me about noon, about midnight with his wife, and he was just thunderstruck. He was real close with uh, 
Grogan and a big SWAT guy, Vietnam vet, and uh, he just was sitting on a crapper somewhere when all this happened, so he was feeling terrible. And that kind of, kind of upset me. I felt bad for the guy and because uh, he was a super guy, and he would have been there had he been able to. And then the very next day, the shooting team from the Bureau arrived, and I wasn't worried about that. I figured, you know, I didn't bother me at all. I, you know, I figured we did everything we could. We did our duty. We killed him, and uh, and uh, so that was the big interview the next day. And I came home after 11 days, and I was out for six months, and then... Uh, they gave me like when I forget what the percentage of disability they gave me I took regular retirement but they uh, I opted for a payout and they figured I had like I don't know kind of the hand was the biggest thing because there's so many bones and stuff in there yeah. and they gave me like 26% payout on uh, the hip uh, the bullet in my hip and uh because of the restricted movement in the hip and then because of the the hand, which aches, you know, still aches to this day. But what about the hip? Any lingering effects of that? No, not that I'm, I'm now I'm 73, so I don't know whether it's because I'm getting older. I don't, I don't know that it ever really bothered me, you know. I mean, I always had a bit of a limp anyway, and I don't know. But the only, I have that ringing, I had that tendonitis because of all the banging over my head, but now I don't even notice it. I was home about two weeks, and uh, my ear drained, and I went, and the guy thought I might have some lead in my head or something. I went down, I remember riding home from the ear doctor, and they said it was, you know, they said I had tendonitis, but not enough to worry about. And I remember riding home, and I was on Sample Road, and, Powerline Boulevard, and I had a flashback. I remember I heard started hearing the bang, and uh, which I thought that hasn't happened since, but that was kind of strange. And then the only other thing I found afterwards that if I was by myself, I'd think about it a lot. Yeah. You know, I never had any regrets. I never had. I know Eddie had apparently a tough time with survivor guilt and all that. I never. You know, I, I've never had uh, any of that. I felt we did our duty. We did what we're supposed to do when we killed them, which is like I say when I teach at the academy. I'm, the uh, those things that I'm left with is uh, that if you do, somebody does take a shot at you, kill them. <laughs> you feel better about yourself because I feel real good that they did. Uh, I'd be sick if they were sitting up in prison. The other thing I always fought with in this thing is... Uh, I didn't want it to dominate. You know, you don't go through something like There's nothing. Uh, your training, I think, is a big thing. But the other thing, and I, the one I'm ever asked is, and I tell these cops, or, or whenever if I'm asked to speak about it to police, I don't do businessmen's meetings, and I never have. I've only probably spoken maybe five or six times. But I tell them, and I sincerely believe this, if you're one of these guys that sloughs on the job, uh, that you leave it to somebody else and you're, you know, you're always uh, too busy, you got to go to the soccer game or something, and if you slough on the job when something like this happens, you'll slough then too, and then you got to live with it. Now, most of the guys that don't have any pride in themselves don't have that problem. But I was up in the hospital, and a guy who was a very smart, competent guy and could have been a real asset, but he was too busy uh, being him. And he came up, and he felt really to apologize that he wasn't there. And I, you know, I told him, I said, hey, you're a fine guy. You're a funny guy. There's no hard feelings. I said, but you were never there. I mean, I had guys, I had guys, I'll never forget it on a Friday, tell me there was a robbery down at Homestead or something like that, you know, and nobody wants to work on Friday, but anyway, I would drive on down there, he ain't there, he'd gone home. <laughs> yeah. you know, so I really believe that, that if you are a guy that doesn't have any pride in himself and doesn't care what his cronies think about him and is too busy, uh, you know, carrying a gun and, and and trying to impress everybody, but it's not doing his job that when the time comes, she probably won't either. 
and then you got to live with it. And some people that, you know, can. And so I told the guy, I said, you know, you don't have to say anything to me. I said, I, you know, God bless you, but you were never around, you know. Yeah. But I really believe that. So I was going to say the other thing I found in my, from my own experience is you can't let, this is a pretty traumatic thing, and you, I did not want it to dominate my life. You know, I didn't want to spend the rest of my life uh, talking about it and have it take over because uh, I thought, you know, it's the kind of thing you got to push out of your mind. At least I found that I had a, you know, I can't be dwelling on this. I got to go out and move on and do some other stuff and get on with my life. And that's why I, you know, and after the shooting, I thought there was so much support. I, I had always planned on retiring at 50, but I thought, God, there's so much support. But then on the other hand, being around it, uh, you know, I didn't want to be talking about it the rest of my life. So I had, I had that thought about, gee, I'll stay on. But then I thought, now I got to get out and go on and do something else, which is what I did. We'll get to the retired at, yeah. at fifty. I hit fifty, and which was uh, when I could retire. When I hit fifty, and I did, and then that's when I I went out. A former AUSA, real prominent criminal defense lawyer, offered me a job, and I thought I could make the academic. It was a probably conceit, but I thought I could make the academic uh, uh, switch, which I couldn't. So I had to, it wasn't long before I realized this was not for me, and that's when I went over to the state attorney's office. Now, how many years did you spend there? At the state attorney? Yeah. 17. I got over there. I left the bureau in November of, I'm sorry, yeah, November of 87, and I went with the uh, law firm, and I was with them till March of 89. And then I went over to the state attorney, and I went through, uh, you know, I had to do the DUIs for about eight months, and then I went into what they call felony trial division, and then in, uh, April of 91, I went into what they call a special uh, prosecutions unit where we prosecuted professionals, maybe lawyers, and also we reviewed allegations of criminal misconduct by uh, policemen. And uh, I did that from April of 89 until I got, I was getting kind of horny handed in. Uh, getting uh, tired of it and I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I say more cops than the union did, but uh, the, uh, well, a lot of people don't understand when a policeman has a lawful right to tell you to do something, he can make you do it depending on what you do to him. And, uh, I handled a lot of the high profile racial cases and in every instance, the policemen were totally, in their right to do what they did. Uh, but I was getting kind of tired of it. And then uh, I got hired, I was offered the job as the inspector general who worked for the uh, Broward Sheriff's Office. So I went over there for a year and a half and then there was a change in the administration and the guy wanted to give uh, his guy my job. He offered me another one and I thought that enough's enough. So in when did I leave? February of 2008. So I was, 70. And uh, I didn't so think I could make the, the acclamation, but I have. You've certainly yeah. earned your retirement. Well, I, I had a wonderful time. I tell people, and I was, I was uh, in 2004, uh, I took the family up to uh, Quantico. I had not been back in ever, and I met a friend of mine down there, and they arranged a tour, and I was in November and rainy, and uh, I was sitting in the car, and they came back, the firearms guy, and they asked me to talk to the young agents, and I told them from the heart, I said, you got a wonderful opportunity. You're going to meet a lot of wonderful people. You're not going to change the world, but you're going to affect some people's lives, and when you get the baby back for somebody, and then you're all they got. You know, when the baby's gone, and they come to you, you know, I said, you got a wonderful opportunity, and I, I miss that. Uh, I got a lot of satisfaction. Of course, I say to people, and it's true, and then I never had to grow up, you know, but I got a lot of satisfaction out of it. I didn't. I hate. I didn't like being a boss. I was a round peg in a square hole. I laughed about it. They asked me to speak at the 100th anniversary of the 
at the Miami uh, celebration, and uh, I laughed about it. I said, back in those days when they asked for my opinion, I thought they wanted it, you know. <laughs> but uh, John, it's really, I've met, met a lot of wonderful people, and I and I uh, and I feel real good about it. John, getting back to the the lessons, if you will, of April 11, 1986, you mentioned that the the fear and the helplessness didn't really hit until you ran out of ammunition and became on oh, yeah. a load. And Gordon McNeil said exactly the same thing. Uh, I know that as soon as they were authorized, uh, Eddie Morales told me he bought a SIG 45 automatic, and McNeil said he bought a 16-shot SIG 9mm. Had, had you stayed... Would you have gone auto pistol too? And do you feel? Oh, um, I, you know, well, if I'd have, you mean if I'd have stayed after this? Right. Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. But I won't well, see. I, in my day, back in the old days, you know, the, the, the concern that was prevalent, right? And I'm talking about in the old days of, of the fatigue uh, on the clip. You know, there was a lot of talk going around that the automatics would fail because of jam, because of fatigue in the clip. So that was kind of floating around. But, I mean, I tell people if I was still on the job, I'd look like Pancho Villa, you know. I'd have, you know, because uh, I was fine. I mean, it never, maybe ignorance is bliss, and I never gave it a minute's thought to running across the street. Now, maybe that was just... You know, ignorance is bliss. And never, you know, I never thought about getting hurt. I wanted to get across the street and help that guy. You know, what what do you uh, carry one, today? One, oh, I don't carry anything. I got an automatic. I bought a, a Glock. In fact, it was funny. We had a cop killing, and I'd go out on him while I was at the sheriff's office. And uh, you know, uh, I still, I, the only thing I still had was that silly little five shots. So I went out and bought a Glock. But I don't carry anything. I got a Glock. I had my dad bought me a car 15 after the shooting, which would have been nice to have at the time. I sold that to a policeman. Uh, you know, I had the 30 round clips. Yeah. I mean, the guy was able to come around my side. That's how he came around. I mean, it would have been. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of lessons. The lessons. I mean, you. I mean, you. The Eddie was shooting that shotgun with one hand. Incidentally, the bravest man I ever met in my life, and just a wonderful guy. But he, you know, you need. He's shooting that rifle slug with one hand. You know, it's. Uh, but the lessons. The lessons. Uh, I don't know. Under based on what we knew, I mean, they talk about plans and and all of that, uh, I don't know what could have been done better under the circumstances. Now, sure, it would have been nice to have, a, you know, the 30-round clips and all that sort of stuff so you could keep up your volume of fire. There's absolutely no question about it, and I think that would have made a big difference. Now, John but, Hall uh, told me that, that subsequent to the incident, the FBI introduced a new block of uh, felony stop training. Uh, do, do you feel? Yeah, I've seen some films on that. I've seen some film on that. You know, and all that stuff. And I think all that. And I'm a big believer in training. There's no doubt about it. Because I think, at least the way we were thinking, that we shooting away from the house, and the fact that we didn't shoot each other, or shoot somebody's dog or their grandmother. I think. I'm a big believer in training because I think that will kick in. But I think the biggest thing is the character of the people that are supposed to do it. You know, uh, the uh, that's what I think is the big thing is are these guys the type of guys that really care about each other and care what they're about their how they're perceived are they perceived as a professional and perceived as a person that you can count on or is it a person who's really uh, you know thinks they're working at the post office or something no reflection on them but are just treating it as you know uh, it's not something that's paramount I mean I know when I had those 
kidnapping cases and stuff. You don't go out and play golf, you know. Well, all, people are dependent on you, you know. People are dependent on you. All of you there that day certainly gave us all a lesson in courage. Do you stay in touch with these surviving members? I know we've lost no. Reisner, Sense, and McNeil. No, no, that tore me up. Uh, that really tore me up. Uh, no, I, I was out at it is. I uh, I missed uh, uh, Gordy McNeil's funeral. I was at I went to Reisner's, which was a tearjerker. And uh, uh, but no, I don't. Uh, I, when I was over at the uh, sheriff's office, um, I put together a symposium, I guess, or symposia. On, uh, and got together a bunch of survivors from nasty shootings. They had some deputies killed and some people that survived it. And it was uh, we got together a panel of guys, and I invited Eddie down, and we paid him to come down. And that's the last time I saw him. I talked to him on the phone off and on. I I I remember in the early going on the anniversary, I'd speak to him, but then I kind of petered out. And then when I saw him, maybe four or five years ago. Uh, but not basically, I think I heard that Arantia retired and got a job out in New Mexico or something like that. I haven't heard or seen anything about Manazzi. I don't know whether he's still living or what the story is. I understand that Reisner was subsequently involved in another shooting. Well, he walked in. I never saw that. He was a character. I'll tell you, he was a tough guy and I had a lot of fun with him. He, I used to drive him nuts because I was, I over the years have developed into a bit of a smart ass and he was such a straight arrow and I used to be able to screw him into the ceiling but I had a lot of respect for him. He was a hard charging, hard work and really good guy to have around and his big buddy was Bob Ross who was also an ex-Marine and they were a couple of guys that knew how to take care of business, you know, and, uh, yeah, he walked up, he was showing photographs that a, he went to a bank that had been robbed and he was going to show the photo spreads and the same guy showed up. And I guess there's a bank surveillance camera photos of him walking up on the guy. And I guess when the guy ran, he shot him through and through the guy survived. I never saw that he, uh, I called him later on. I said, pal, you got to go find some other line of work. But he was a very, very dedicated, hardworking guy. I mean, uh, we, we were the types of people that wanted to be involved. And if you wanted to be involved, there was a lot to get involved in. And, uh, and if you show, you know, government's funny. I, I always laugh about it in that they'll, they'll accept the degree of competence that you want to display. Uh, if you display, you know what you're doing. You you you'll get to use that. If you show you're a complete dunce, uh, they'll seem to kind of tolerate that. There's always a job. You can always put them on. You know, sitting there with the microphone, with the the headset on, listening to you know conversations. You know, but they'll they seem to accept that amount of performance that you're willing to show. And it's always been funny to me that, uh, you know, you have those guys that really came on the job to do something and then those that don't, and I don't have much time for those that don't, you know, or didn't. I understand. I guess that's because I gave them, uh, I had it, I gave, uh, I, I got to do everything I ever wanted to do. It was wonderful. And that's what I told those kids, those young kids up at Quantico. And then when I gave this, I was, this thing at the 100th anniversary, which was really, I was proud to do. I was flattered. Uh, there's about 400 law enforcement there. And it was, uh, it was, and I paid my tributes to them. I, uh, I don't know whether you read the, forward. I, the first book, I never and then the books by Anderson, I never really got involved in. He called me and I didn't really want to. But then when he did the 20th anniversary thing, I five, uh, four, did the forward for him. But uh, I, you know, when I was a new agent, uh, the ton of fish, the ton of flesh, cheeky with Bob Green at the Tampa PD and they must have thought that I'd get killed out there and they took me under their wing and then 
Uh, and then Rick Fry coming across the street. I mean, uh, you can't, where are you going to go and meet people like this, you know? These are the, that's, that's you true enough. Those, you can't pay those guys, you can't pay those people enough money, and there's enough of them around, maybe 10, 15%, you know, of every organization, and those are the guys you want to sidle up to, and those are the guys that you want men to feel that you're, uh, an equal and a professional, and that uh, you have, I have a lot of regard for them, and I, I wanted them to have a high regard for me, and uh, that was important to me. Well, it's certainly. I that's what they, I think that's what makes the difference when the when the, the when it hits the fan. You look to the guys that have pride in themselves and pride in the organization and, prof- and pride in the profession. You know. I've talked to a lot of people. I don't know how anybody else goes out and sells refrigerators, you know. <laughs> I see these young cops riding around, and I think I hope they appreciate what a great job they have, even though there's a lot of – it's a whole different day today. I mean, it's much more dangerous. I see these cops out stopping vans and stuff, and it gives me cold chills. I mean, even to this day, I still get chills when I think about it. So it has a pretty profound effect on you. You can't – you can't not, but then you got to you go ahead and deal with it. And like I said the other day, I I don't. I'm almost. I I am. I I found I had to push it back so that I didn't let it become the biggest thing in my life. I also worried I didn't want to embarrass myself by getting up in front of a bunch of people that got shot at in Vietnam for a year and or stormed ashore. And, Iwo Jima, and I'm up there talking about somebody that shot at me for three minutes. You know, I think you gotta keep it in perspective, even though uh, it was a, it's a pretty traumatic thing. But you don't want that. I was lucky. I can understand why people have post-traumatic stress. If you come home and you can develop it from something like this if you don't have a family and you don't have a job and you don't have something to take your mind off it because you really got to take you, you if you were to sit around and dwell on on some of the things these poor kids are saying i mean you could get pretty screwed up i remember i kind of had the john wayne syndrome you know and i was home maybe three or four months after and i was i was by myself and i had a couple of rum and tonics and all of a sudden i got uh i got nuts and uh, it scared me so bad i didn't take a drink for seven years i didn't want to i'm happy to report i no longer have that problem (laughs) but uh, uh of course i can't handle the volume anymore but uh I I don't know what I have to offer from the technical training side of it. Well, John, let, let me ask you this: you've, you've had a quarter century to to look at it. You know, everybody and his brother have Monday morning quarterbacked you guys. If you could go back in a time machine, knowing what you know now, is there anything you'd you'd recommend be done different? Oh yeah, I mean, there's no doubt armament. You know, the weaponry. You got to outgun them, you know. I mean, you look at that thing, it was unbelievable. That's, how about that thing out in L.A.? Yeah. You know. Yeah, North, Hollywood. North, at Northridge. I mean, good God. And then those guys ride down the middle of the street. I mean, they're just lucky they're in dead cops all over the place. But it's weaponry. As far as the planning and, and under the circumstances without any, I mean, the, the, a guy called me. Uh, he was doing a thesis on it, and he asked me for some stuff, and I sent him a bunch of stuff. And uh, he wrote his thing, and he said that his theory was that it was a lackadaisical approach to the thing. And and I ordinarily I'm really uh, very sensitive to any criticism because anybody that would criticize wasn't there. And I think under the circumstances with what we had, we did admirably well. And that's, I say that even though two guys got killed. I mean, the felony stops are wonderful if the guy wants to stop, you know. Uh, you got two heavily armed guys with 30 round clips. Uh, uh, that's going to be a problem uh, under any set of circumstances. But there's no doubt in my mind if, you know, we were better armed now, were there guys out there with some guns that would have been helpful? Sure. 
would have had, had me all hell if I'd have had a 30 round clip, uh, you know, M16, uh, and was able to stop and hadn't run out of ammunition. I would have been able to stop Platt from coming around the car and killing everybody, but that wasn't the circumstance. And, uh, but again, I, uh, while, you know, you guys and uh, people that, that, that know far more about the tactics and stops, I mean, I made a lot of arrests in my time, and I was lucky. And I I think, I mean, I walked up on escapees from prison by must and not, you know, and stumbled on them. And I remember as a new agent telling the guy to back up, I'm going to cuff him, and if he tries to hurt me, I'll kill him. I mean, he believed me, which was nice, you know. <laughs> but I think, what I'm most proud of, and I'm not, this is not patting us on the back. I think under the circumstances, everybody performed as well as anybody could have. And uh, we did what we, re- I got asked to go up and testify uh, on the Brady bill. And there was a little teacher up there that was uh, there who testified about some moron coming on the school grounds and shooting a bunch of kids. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, pretty ballsy lady, you know. And I said then, and I said now, we did what we're supposed to do. And I, I think the biggest thing is that can be stressed. Because I think a lot of people come in the FBI and a lot of people sign up for the police department that have absolutely no idea what it's all about and what's going to be expected of them. You know, you're going to be expected to deal with some pretty dangerous people that want to man, women, and child are going to want to hurt you. And uh, you're going to have to, you know, dominate. I remember them dominate the situation, and that's what you got to do. And you got to be prepared to pull the trigger. And I think that's the big thing is to to impress on these people that you've got to be you know you got to be ready and you got to be prepared and you got to be trained and you got to take care of yourself you got to take care of your partners and the people and and you got to build that confidence and that character over your career so when you happen to fall into one of these situations you will run across I've just thank God I ran across that street. Uh, of course, I say that because I'm standing, you know, I'm kind of leaning to the right, but I'm still standing, you know, <laughs> but how would you live with yourself? Uh, I don't, I couldn't live with myself, even though I don't think I contributed anything to anybody, and, uh, but that's, uh, other than what everybody else has said, we were outgunned, there's no doubt about that, and maybe if we weren't, Grogan and Dove would still be alive, but that wasn't the, wasn't the situation. I don't know how, I guarantee you, I mean, if we had any idea that they were coming, I probably wouldn't even have been there. <laughs> that, would have, that would have been left to those two-fisted SWAT guys who were never around to work the case, but if you want to go down to Key West and, and scuba dive, I mean, that's, that's always good, too. You know, I always related to, I had a young cop come up to me who got uh, got involved in a bad situation with somebody who was shooting at him, and he shot through with his own, uh, he's a bespeckled, kind of overweight young guy, and he shot through his own windshield and killed the guy. I mean, that's usually the way it goes, you know. Well, John, I want to thank you for but taking I don't the know, time. I don't know. Yeah, my pleasure. I don't know what else to tell you. I, uh, I, I was saying this guy that wrote the papers, I mean, once... Once uh, Grogan comes on the air and says we're back behind the black Monte Carlo, uh, there was no more lackadaisical attitude, i got to tell you. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's when training and the character kicks in. All of you that day gave all the rest of us a lasting lesson in courage and determination. And on behalf well, of nice. everyone who sees this, thank you for that. Well, that's nice of you to say. I feel I feel very good about what we did, and uh, I just I hate to see, you know, cops get hurt. It just uh, tears your heart out, you know. It really does. And uh, like they, you know, they had that thing down in Miami, and of course it was funny. I told them I, they apparently must not have looked at my personnel file when they asked me to do it, but 
computer ad. I have uh, there's nobody that has higher regard for law enforcement than I do. Nobody. And uh, the uh, and when you see a cop get killed, he's out there laying down his life for people he doesn't even know. And that's that's pretty damn noble. That's pretty noble. That's very noble in my mind. But like I say, I tell them, tell the boys for me that if somebody takes a shot at them, kill them. Because, boy, it does make you feel a hell of a lot better, you know. But I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very, very much to John Hanlon for taking the time to share with us uh, a lot of things uh, that probably uh, were bringing some new stuff out. And certainly of the agents over the years who had talked about this, uh, some of whom are no longer with us, John was not one of the ones that was out on the circuit, as it were. Uh, telling the story and all that. So uh, you folks are hearing or have heard, you know, probably a unique piece of oral history here. And we hope you enjoyed it as much as we have and have gotten a lot out of it and found it to be quite revealing about the mind of someone who has gone in harm's way, had suffered <laughs> severely at, uh, in the process of doing so and has still been able to move on and finish out a long and successful career of public service. See you next time. Good night, Gail. Good night, Steve. Good night, Mass. Good night, Chet. <laughs> Alarm's podcast music is by Kevin McLeod. 